Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Cause you are good. You're good. Oh, 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 and let the king of my heart.
I just want to start out by saying that we miss you. Oh, man, we miss seeing your faces, hearing your voices, watching the way you love on one another and, and care for one another and pray for one another. And I just wanted you to know that we love you and, um, and we pray for you often. Okay, well, we are in our third week of a collection of talks based on author and pastor Mark Batterson's book, Win the Day, Seven Daily Habits to Stressing Less and Accomplishing More. Um, we began this collection by getting rid of the old things that hold us back so that we can make room for the new thing that God is doing in our lives. In the first week, we learned that the difference between success and failure lies in the stories that we tell ourselves. So whether they're true or false, the stories we tell ourselves are self-fulfilling prophecies. Because of that, we were taught to flip the script on our negative and defeating thoughts. To understand that God has given us a new name, His name. And with His name, we not only get a new identity, but we are grafted into His story. And the really exciting part of that is that God writes His story, or history, through us. Then last week, Calvin taught us about the next concept, kiss the wave that throws us against the rock of ages. This means that even in the face of our difficult pasts, which are impossible to change, we can choose to leverage the lessons we've learned in these hard places for our good. God even comes to us in the disguise of hardship. And we can discover that in every circumstance, from the greatest of joys to the deepest of sorrows, there is an opportunity to know new dimensions of God's character. What was significant for me was realizing that even though we are not responsible for the things that have happened to us in the past, or the things that might even be happening to us right now, by the grace of God, we are response-able. In other words, we are able to choose our response. And taking ownership of this gives us the opportunity to kiss the wave. In our house and at the office, Calvin and I have been having fun uh, with the terminology that we've been learning and teaching during this collection. The other day went something like this. Hey babe, what's going on? This message just isn't coming together. I don't really feel like I'm winning the day. Oh, well that is frustrating. I know how you feel. Well, maybe you just need to flip the script. Oh, yeah. I need to kiss the wave. <laughs> well, today the key point is called eat the frog. I'm, I know, I'm like, why did I get that one? Eat the frog. Gross. Um, but stay with me, and I'll explain what it means. But first, I want you to hear this poem by Gloria Pitzer. It says this, Procrastination is my sin. It brings me naught but sorrow. I know that I should stop it. In fact, I will tomorrow. Maybe you can relate to that. I always know when I'm procrastinating, when I suddenly have this deep desire to want to clean the darkest places, the cupboards, the drawers, and the corners, and the closets of my house. Well, affectionately considered one of the greatest American writers of all time, and known for his works such as The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, um, Mark Twain was said to have given this advice. If you ever have to eat a live frog, it's best done first thing in the morning. <laughs> Further to that, he said, if you have to eat two frogs, he reportedly recommended eating the bigger one first. Well, what is he getting at here? And why is this such good advice? Well, essentially, he's saying, do the hard thing first and get it out of the way so then you can go through the rest of your day knowing the toughest part is already behind you. So let's start thinking about our frog. Batterson suggests it could be the thing on your to-do list that you're procra procrastinating on. Um, the goals that never even get off the ground but still get carried over from one year to the next. 
It could be a difficult decision you have been delaying. Have you got something in your mind? Can you already say you know what your frog is? Well, friends, we've all got one, at least one. But here's the thing. So often we just pray and expect God to work it all out for us somehow. Do you remember that the Bible exhorts us to work out our salvation? In other words, work at figuring out God's way of doing life. I love this quote from Batterson. He says, You can't just pray like it depends on God. You also have to work like it depends on you. If you want God to do the super, super, then you need to do the natural. So we can likely all agree that there are things we do not necessarily enjoy doing, but we know if we do them, they will offer us a great reward. Not only that, but if we want to win the day, we've got to start off on the right foot. In Colossians chapter 3, we learn all about putting on the new self. That's what we're talking about here. It basically says, now that you belong to Christ. So assuming you're a believer in Jesus, the Son of God, who came as a baby, who as a man taught us how to live the God way, and then suffered and died to pay the price for our sin, was risen again, victorious, conquering death, hell, and the grave, all so that we could experience a relationship with God, our holy heavenly Father. So like assuming all of that, <laughs> Paul says, now that you are part of the family of God, it's time to grow up in the faith. Growing up means putting away childish behaviors and adopting mature behaviors. So what are we to let go of? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Why? Because it's selfish. It can be demoralizing to others and also affects our intimacy with God. He goes on to say that while we're at it, we must put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from our mouths. This not only includes vulgarity, but also curse words. My grandmother used to say, swearing is a sign of weak vocabulary. And finally, do not lie to one another. Do you know that there's three ways to tell a lie? First, there's the out-and-out -out contradiction of the truth. That's the most obvious one. But then there's only telling part of the story. And finally, there's telling the truth in a way that is unconvincing. So we could say that's misleading. But now here's the really good news. Paul says once we begin to put off the old self, we can put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge of the image of its creator. So do you remember that God gave us a new name? Not just any name, his name? Well, he gave us a new identity. And now Paul is urging us to bring our behavior into alignment with who we are in Christ. In doing so, we will better reflect the image of Christ in us. But here's the thing, nobody gets it right all the time. The scripture we just read says we are being renewed, and this speaks to the ongoing transformation of Christians. I want to encourage you here by saying this isn't something we can do on our own apart from God. It isn't something that we can just will to be, or something we can accomplish just pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. If so, many of us wouldn't have already given up our New Year's resolutions. We wouldn't be stuck in grief, or patterns of dysfunction, or any other hurts, habits, or hang-ups. That's why we need the help of the Holy Spirit, the support of our family of faith, and sometimes the help of those that God has gifted with knowledge in the professional field. But we certainly are response-able, and we can get started right away. Putting off the old and putting on the new is a lot like this good advice. We don't break bad habits, we replace them with good ones. Let's see what the scriptures say we can put on. In verse 12, it says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. So right there, he's telling us, this is your identity. You are holy, beloved, and chosen by God. So put on kindness, humility, 
meekness and patience, bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So we don't need to focus so much on what we ought to stop doing. Sure, go ahead and surrender those things that you know are a struggle. Maybe the Holy Spirit is giving you one of his infamous nudges in the ribs as you heard the scriptures today. Well, sure, by all means, surrender that to the Lord and invite him by the power of his spirit to help you. But I would say focus more on who God is calling you to be and allow him to keep transforming you day by day, more and more, into the likeness of his son, Jesus. And you know what? The truth is, living like Jesus is attractive and winsome to others. It's been said that a winsome Christian is one who is dependent on God, who walks in wisdom towards outsiders, and is gracious in speech. Isn't that a high calling for each of us? I hope you desire that to be the kind of legacy to be said of you. I know that I do. In sermons like this, it's always tempting to reduce our spiritual growth to a simple formula. If you do X, Y, and Z, you'll accomplish, accomplish your spiritual growth goals. Well, it's not quite like that. Yes, spiritual disciplines are so important, and I want nothing more for you than to have a consistent prayer life and a solid daily Bible reading plan. But I actually want so much more. I want you to know that you are deeply loved and accepted by God. I want you to continually experience his presence in fresh ways. I hope for you to genuinely desire to make time for him in your schedule. Talking to him through prayer, yes. And listening to him through his scriptures, yes. And fiercely protecting that time together. My prayer for you is that you will embark on new adventures as you follow after him. That you would find greater revelations of who he is and what he's doing in your own life. And to know more of the mystery and awe that is found in relationship with God Almighty. To know lasting joy and peace that passes understanding. To know what it means to rest in God's grace and trust in God's timing. This is really living the Christian life. And that's what I want for you and for myself. Batterson shares the importance of time with Jesus in his own life and story and the impact this has on his, on his day. This practice is what he believes sets him up to win the day. Now, some people find the evening works better for them. And true to Jewish culture, the beginning of the day starts in the evening. <laughs> After all, this is when we set our alarms and decide when we're going to be waking up in the morning. <laughs> so whether you're a night owl or an early morning riser, the most important thing is that you are intentional about your priorities. Batterson reminds us that confessing our sins to God in prayer is so, is so important to our growth. It shows humility and dependence on God. Keeping short accounts with God helps us to stay in a right relationship with Him. There is um, making sure there is nothing standing in the way of our intimacy with God. Here's the thing. God already knows our shortcomings. So sometimes the greatest feat is our own awareness. I read this devotional thought by author Ann Voskamp this week. And this is what it says. Today's a new hope and you're being remade and made new. And he's cupping your chin right now and turning your face toward his and the sun. Then he shares this verse from the message translation. My loyal love for you can't run out. 
My merciful love for you could never dry up. They're created new for you every single morning. My faithfulness to you is great. She goes on to say, when morning breaks, it breaks all of the mistakes of yesterday. It breaks right through our dome of dark so that all his fresh mercies can flood in. To recap for a moment, so far we've been encouraged to eat the frog, to tackle difficult things, tasks, or situations head on. And we've been encouraged to spend time nurturing our relationship with God. Before we finish today, there are some practical tips to equip us as we put on the new. The first tip is called habit stacking. This is when you take one habit that, you don't necess that doesn't necessarily come easy, or maybe is better defined as something you tend to procrastinate doing, and you stack it with another habit that you really enjoy doing. A good example of this is our girl, Julia. This year she started um, attending university and like so many other students, isn't able to study on campus or attend classes on campus. And so the entire year is being done virtually. So her psychology work is largely research and writing based. And so she has a lot of papers to write at pretty much any given time. While she mostly enjoys the program, sometimes the demands require her to buckle down and write, even when she's not necessarily feeling it. <laughs> so her go-to in moments like that, prior to our stay-at-home order, of course, um, was to do it at Starbucks. So she's stacking her homework habit with her love for ice caramel macchiatos. So there you have it. <laughs> Another tip and word of encouragement, though it may not feel like it, is this, repetition, repetition, repetition. Sometimes there just aren't any shortcuts. And the best way to learn, even the only way to learn, sometimes is through repetition. Musicians know this to be true. If you want to be any good at all, and be good, I mean be able to play the song, <laughs> um, you have to practice. In the beginning, it's not easy. But once you develop the skill in repetition for several days, weeks, and months, it will turn from an action into a habit. Success is often directly related to repetition. When Mark Batterson felt a call to write, he decided to read 200 books a year. Why? because he had heard that the average author puts two years of life experience into a book. And because he was only 25 when he started to feel the call to write, he realized he didn't have a lot of life experience. So he did the math. If he read 200, 200 books a year, that was 400 um, years of experience in that one year that he could gain. The principle of repetition can be traced all the way back to the Jewish people who would integrate the commandments into every part of their daily lives. They posted them on the door frames of their homes. They repeated them again and again to their children. Did you know a devout Jewish person pronounces 100 blessings a day? <laughs> Rituals can be a powerful way for believers to be brought back to the essential core beliefs, to both express and reaffirm their faith. When Calvin wrote a faith declaration for our church, we would say it together at the start of every service. <laughs> I hope it hasn't been too long. I hope you can remember it. Let's say it together. This is my Bible, God's spoken word to me. I trust what it says and do what it commands with the strength that he provides. This is my family of faith, whom I will love at all times and help them always to walk in the truth of God's word. My God is eternal, immortal, almighty, and all loving. Amen. Well, this declaration we repeated every week helped us to remember who we serve, who we belong to, and the unity we share in our family of faith. In my own life, I have a picture hanging in my bedroom it's the verse of 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 to 18. And it says, Rejoice always, 
And in my mind, I always say, return to joy always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I don't just say the words. I reflect on the passage. I reflect on how much joy I have. I reflect on who I can pray for. I can reflect on what I have to be thankful for and how I can trust God in the circumstances that I find myself in. Some of you, like Julia, have mastered habit stacking. You would fit the description like this. Coffee gets me started and Jesus keeps me going. Well, for me, we all know it's tea. Tea and Jesus. <laughs> but not only that, I have a blanket. I have a special place in the living room. I like to sit with a lamp and a table and a pen and our, Mac, and our dog Max sitting with me. Psalm 51 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O God, but restore unto me the joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Jesus was our greatest example in this. Jesus, our ultimate example of one who mastered the rhythm of life that we desire. He had times of solitude with God, and then he served others. And then times of solitude with God and service to others. We spend time so that we can be strengthened for seasons ahead of us. We get renewed so we can be prepared. We get focused on him so that we know which direction to go. Our time with the Lord gives us strength and power because there is more right in front of us, more for you personally, more for your marriage, more for your family, more for this church, more for Kempville and North Grenville, more, more, more. I know these days are a challenge and I encourage you to be strong in the Lord. I encourage you to run to the Father and to hide in the shelter of his wings. Please bow with me for prayer. Father God, I thank you today for your great love for us. Father, I thank you that your word says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Father, you demonstrated your love for us in providing a way for us to know you, to experience the power that comes from being in a relationship with you, God, to be led by your Holy Spirit, to receive comfort and peace in times of difficulty. And God, in these challenging days that we're in, Father, I pray that we would be a people that would run to you. God, that we would stand and be strong in the Lord. God, that we would look to you, that we would allow your statutes and your commands to guide our lives, God, in the direction of our living. Oh, Father, we love you. We're, gracious, we're grateful for the opportunity to worship you and to serve you in this country today. Father, be with each and every one of us, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.